Over the last half century, the Kentucky General Assembly has been on a journey. That journey has seen the legislature free itself from decades of control by the governor and mature into an innovative, dynamic, co-equal partner in Kentucky state government. This era of change began in the 60s when a group of visionary lawmakers declaring that the legislative branch, the branch of government closest to the people, should not and would not remain a rubber stamp for an all-powerful executive. They set about laying a foundation for today's General Assembly, a body fully exercising its constitutional authority, representing the needs and the aspirations of the Kentuckians who elected them. These early apostles of legislative independence saw that the creation of a skilled, professional, and strictly nonpartisan staff was one key to the fulfillment of their vision. Professional staffing would provide the independent research and bill drafting services that would free the legislature to assume its proper role as a co-equal branch of government. Development of the Legislative Research Commission as the staff arm of the General Assembly was a critical step on the road to true independence. Today, given the legislature's status and achievements, it may be tempting to believe that the journey has been completed, but legislative staffers must stay vigilant so the General Assembly and the Legislative Research Commission are kept strong. As they serve all 138 members of the legislature, they must never forget that they are, in part, the keepers of a living trust, the legacy of legislative independence. In 1922, Governor Edwin Porch Morrow proposed creation of the Efficiency Commission of Kentucky to study all branches of state government and to recommend ways to improve its professional capabilities. The four-member commission was appointed in 1923 and submitted its report to the governor and to the General Assembly on January 1, 1924. Part of that report recommended reducing the number of legislative committees from 38 in the Senate and 69 in the House to 15 parallel or joint committees, a good idea whose implementation would languish for many decades. The report also recommended creation of a legislative reference bureau in charge of a competent research staff that would be located in the state library. This never happened. During the administration of Governor Happy Chandler, the Legislative Council was created by the Government Reorganization Act of 1936. This was a precursor to today's LRC. At that time, legislators had virtually no assistance with research and bill drafting. The Attorney General's office was available to help draft legislation considered important, but the Attorney General, with the so-called help and gentle guidance of the Governor, decided what constituted important legislation. The Legislative Council of 1936 consisted of five senators appointed by the Lieutenant Governor, five representatives appointed by the Speaker of the House, five administrative officials appointed by the Governor, who was an honorary member, the Lieutenant Governor, who served as Senate President, was the ex officio chair, and the Speaker of the House was the ex officio vice chair. This executive legislative mix strikingly demonstrates the direct involvement of the governor in legislative affairs, while the council provided a theoretical framework for greater legislative self-sufficiency. No funding for it was provided from the general fund. With no money, aside from a $16,000 grant from the Spellman Foundation, and no clear focus or meaningful direction, the council provided little service to the legislature. In 1943, the five executive branch members were removed from the council, a tentative early move towards some legislative independence. But with no budget and no access to the information available to the executive branch, the council was essentially powerless. Although it began with a staff of eight and a part-time director, by 1944 the council had no staff at all. The legislative council limped along existing basically in name only until two powerful legislators began jockeying for the position to run for governor. House Speaker Harry Lee Waterfield favored a strong role for the council, 
and propose two committees to meet monthly through the interim, the period of time between legislative sessions. This would be supported by a professional research staff and an appropriation of $100,000. Senator Earl Clements, fearing a strong council would provide a springboard for Waterfield's gubernatorial ambitions, opposed the Speaker's proposal during the 1944 and 1946 sessions. After Clements was elected governor in 1947, the Legislative Council was abolished by the 1948 General Assembly. In its stead, with Clements' approval, the Legislative Research Commission was created. Initially, the LRC had seven members. The governor was chairman, but could appoint the lieutenant governor to serve in that role. Senate members were the president pro tem, the majority floor leader, and the minority floor leader. House members were the speaker, the majority floor leader, and the minority floor leader. The first director of the LRC was General A.Y. Lloyd. At this time, the governor's influence in selecting legislative leaders was still dominant, allowing Clement's loyalists to control the LRC, and in a larger sense, the General Assembly. During the 50s and 60s, various governors continued to exert almost absolute control over the legislature. Not only did the governor chair the LRC, he also handpicked legislative leaders and committee chairs. In fact, each morning of the legislative session, the list of bills that were to pass that day was delivered to the third floor chambers from the governor's first floor office, and legislators followed that script. Separation of powers, as envisioned by the founders, did not exist. It was a sad state of affairs. In 1967, Kentucky voters elected Louis Nunn as the first Republican governor in 20 years. But a Democrat, Wendell Ford, was elected lieutenant governor, and Julian Carroll, another Democrat who would later serve as governor, was Speaker of the House. The inevitable political dynamics of having a governor of one party and a lieutenant governor and legislative leadership of a different party opened the door to what was to become a full-fledged movement toward legislative independence. Carroll and Ford, both products of the legislature who appreciated its potential, set about modernizing the LRC as an effective arm of a more assertive General Assembly. Professional staff employment began. Committees of each chamber were vastly reduced in number and organized into corresponding jurisdictions, much as had been recommended by Governor Morrow's report more than 40 years earlier. A between-sessions committee system was established to provide continuing legislative presence in Frankfurt, and a budget review process was implemented. Of all these innovations, perhaps the most significant was the creation of the Interim Joint Committee system. Interim Joint Committees allow Senate and House members serving on similar committees to meet together between legislative sessions to gather information and hear testimony on issues they will deal with in the upcoming session. Prior to the creation of the Interim Joint Committee system, legislators came to Frankfurt only once every two years for 60 consecutive days. The Kentucky Constitution limited how often and how long they met in regular session. They came without formal preparation and little access to information. They came together as strangers from all across the Commonwealth. They met in Frankfurt under the direction of a governor who had a professional staff with information drawn from thousands of executive branch employees. Lawmakers had no such resources. Even if they'd been inclined to independence, such an assertion would have been impractical at best. Because they were ill-informed and unprepared on many issues, legislators deferred to the governor's judgment and wishes more often than not. Substantive debate was rare. The General Assembly was little more than a rubber stamp for a forceful executive. The arrival of the interim joint committee system changed all that. By attending several committee meetings with their colleagues each month, lawmakers began to see the General Assembly as a cohesive whole rather than a loose confederacy of nodding acquaintances. A camaraderie emerged, and from this camaraderie grew friendships and the desire to help one another as each served his or her section of the state. The provincialism which had long dominated the politics of Kentucky began to dissipate. A fuller appreciation of the wants and needs of all Kentucky began to emerge. Plus, with months of study and interim committee meetings as preparation, 
legislators came into session with newly acquired knowledge and a new expertise as policymakers. The streamlining of the committee structure into fewer jurisdictions had another positive effect. Fewer committee assignments meant individual members had the opportunity to focus on specific areas of interest and able to become experts in those matters. This left them better informed and better prepared to make sound decisions when a session rolled around, independent of what the executive branch experts might contend. In 1977, a major step was taken toward an independent LRC when Vic Heller Jr. became the first director to be selected by the leadership of the General Assembly rather than by the governor. Having himself served as a member of the House of Representatives, Hellard understood the need for a professional staff in development of an independent General Assembly. With an LRC director chosen by legislative leadership, the General Assembly now had a confidant, an advisor with an interest of the members and the institution at heart. Hellard would continue to serve the General Assembly for nearly two decades, often quipping that he had 138 bosses. Under his leadership, the LRC evolved into one of the premier legislative service agencies in the country. During the 1979 special session, a group of young senators who became known as the Black Sheep Squadron took significant steps toward making the General Assembly truly independent. This group, named after a popular TV show of the day, was forged under the strong leadership of Majority Leader John Barry, President Pro Tem Joe Prather, and others. They earned their nickname because they frequently defied the wishes of a governor of their own party, insisting that policymaking was properly a legislative, not executive, function. The Black Sheep helped lead the General Assembly through a critical time in the struggle for independence. Over the next decade, the LRC expanded its operational scope, adding staff and office space as the General Assembly itself asserted its constitutional autonomy. Legislative leaders consolidated their gains and stood firm on numerous policy confrontations with executive branch officials and governors themselves. Key to the success of the effort was public support, owing largely to an opening up of the legislative process to public scrutiny and participation. Among those initiatives, passage of the Open Meetings Act, nightly TV coverage of session activities by KET, creation of the LRC's Public Information Office, opening up the House and Senate Rules Committees to public view, and construction of committee rooms in the Capitol Annex, large enough to accommodate members of the public so citizens could see and participate in committee deliberations. Additionally, the legislature created a number of oversight committees to monitor the executive branch with an eye toward stopping reported abuses. These included the Personal Service Contract Committee, the Capital Construction and Equipment Purchase Oversight Committee, the Program Review and Investigation Committee, and various budget review committees. In 1979, the Kenton Amendment to the Kentucky Constitution was approved by the voters of the Commonwealth. Named for the late Speaker William Bill Kenton, the amendment made dramatic changes to the nature and operations of the General Assembly. The amendment placed selection of legislative leadership, once and for all, beyond the governor's control. It restructured the legislative election cycle so members could take office a full year before legislative sessions and thereby get a full year of interim committee work under their belt. It also took legislative races out of the gubernatorial election year. It created the odd year organizational session and expanded the overall time frame for regular sessions from 60 consecutive days to 60 working days, with adjournments set at April 15th of even-numbered years. The passage of the Kenton Amendment was a watershed moment in the journey to legislative independence. But as the new independent General Assembly emerged, many other milestones were passed, including independent professional staff for all leadership offices in addition to the regular nonpartisan LRC staff the Brown vs. LRC lawsuit, which helped define, in a major court opinion, the separation of legislative and executive branch powers. The Kentucky Education Reform Act, a national model. Removal of the Lieutenant Governor as presiding officer of the Senate. The advent of annual legislative sessions. 
and creation of the Kentucky Legislative Ethics Commission. The 2000 regular session of the General Assembly began with history being made as a new Republican majority assumed leadership in the Senate for the first time. With the smooth transfer in power, Senate committees were placed under Republican chairs and the makeup of the Legislative Research Commission changed to reflect the legislature's new balance of power. 17 years later, a significant change came to the House of Representatives as it too saw Republicans gain a majority and the Speaker's chair. Today, the Legislative Research Commission is composed of the entire House and Senate leadership and employs a director selected by the Commission. As we've seen, the journey to that independence has been a long one. From today's perspective, the first halting steps to a mature legislative branch seemed long ago and far away. But as stewards of an idea, caretakers of a dream, the LRC's work is never done. That journey may be near its destination, but there is one certainty. New work, harder work, and challenges unimagined surely lie ahead. The LRC's inheritance is a proud legacy, and the agency's ongoing challenge is to preserve that legacy. <laughs>